Welcome to Now in the 90s, where we look at the game releases of 30 years ago today. This week, a werewolf, a movie game, and another flight sim. Hi, I'm your host, Jared, and today is January 20th, 1993. A computer hit makes its way onto consoles. Released this week in 1993, was Wolfchild for the Sega CD. Wolfchild is a side-scrolling action platformer where you play as a dude who can transform into a wolf. Run, jump, and attack enemies through a variety of stages and fight a boss at the end. Though you start as a buff dude with long flowing wolf-like hair, once you collect enough what I assume is wolf energy, you will transform into a wolf man. Or child. Your attacks are upgraded to do more damage and have a variety of projectiles. Take enough damage or lose enough energy and you revert back to a human. Wolf Child for the Sega CD is a port of the highly regarded Amiga version. The original was developed by Core Design and they also did the port to make sure it would be as accurate as possible. Although, there are some differences. The Amiga original had a surprisingly elaborate intro cinematic with voice acting and character art that can only be described as someone who just bought their first how to draw manga book. The Sega CD version expands on this with more scenes, more animations, and clearer voice acting. It also has an improved frame rate and resolution, and the soundtrack is pretty good. The Amiga version was loved. The Sega CD version was not loved so much unless you're GamePro Magazine, because they love everything. European Sega-focused magazine Mega rated the console version with a 32%, complaining that the Sega CD hardware wasn't really being utilized and that the asking price was too much for a simple port. Wolfchild would later get ported to the Sega Genesis, Sega Game Gear, Sega Master System, and the Super Nintendo, all later this year, where they would also get lukewarm reception at best. From ports to adaptations, released this week in 1993, was The Hunt for Red October for the Super Nintendo. The Hunt for Red October is a horizontally scrolling shoot 'em up only you're a submarine. Travel through water, shoot all kinds of torpedoes and missiles, and get to the end of each level. You can also surface at the top of the water to take out airborne enemies, or stay deep underwater and just ignore them altogether. You can also locate hidden bonus stages, where it switches to a first-person view, and you blow the crap out of all kinds of boats and helicopters, all with limited ammunition. The Hunt for Red October is a licensed game, based off the film of the same name from 1990. The Super Nintendo version of the game is also an upgraded port of the game on the NES, which itself is based loosely on the home computer versions from 1987, and those games were based on the 1984 novel. I think I got that right. Compared to the NES version, the Super Nintendo game is missing quite a bit. Some cutscenes, several levels, and it doesn't have the side-scrolling platformer final stage. However, the SNES version makes up for it by having those first-person bonus minigames, and those bonus stages can be played using the Super Scope, making The Hunt for Red October one of only 11 SNES games that is compatible with the Super Scope. The game is pretty dumb. Electronic Gaming Monthly reviewed it with an average score of a 5 out of 10, criticizing just how slow the game plays for a shoot 'em up. It also didn't make anyone feel better about having purchased a Super Scope. Since we're on combat vehicle games, also released for the Sega CD this week in 1993 was AH3 Thunderstrike. AH3 Thunderstrike is a first-person helicopter game. Fly around an open-range map and take out numerous targets, from tanks to missile trucks to innocent trees. Each stage puts you in a different part of the world, giving stage variety like farmlands or an oil refinery. Between levels, fully voiced briefing cinematics give context as to why you're shooting what you're shooting that I never paid attention to. Thunderstrike is, of course, another port for the Sega CD. It was originally on Amiga home computers in 1992, where it was titled Thunderhawk. The Sega CD version, however, blows it out of the water. It is highly considered to be one of the best looking Sega CD games, with smooth frame rates and pseudo 3D gameplay. The Sega CD version sadly doesn't have that cheesy, cartoony opening sequence that the Amiga version had, opting instead for something cooler with electric guitars rocking out. When it came out, People loved Thunderstrike. It became a bestseller for the Sega CD in the UK. Mega Magazine did a list of the best Sega CD games of all time in issue 26, and Thunderstrike was listed at number one. Next Generation Magazine also put Thunderstrike as the best Sega CD game in issue 14. It got remade for home computers in 1996 and spawned 
two sequels, Thunderstrike 2 for the PlayStation 1 and the Sega Saturn, and finally, Thunderhawk Operation Phoenix for the PlayStation 2 in 2001. Every Thunderstrike game, from the Amiga original to this Sega CD port to the aforementioned sequels, were all developed by the same studio. Core design. That means between Thunderstrike, Wolfchild, and last week's Wonder Dog, Core Design has been busy. Speaking of keeping busy, for all the other releases this week, here's Editor Dylan. All home ports of Race Driving with an apostrophe released around this time, so I'll lump them all into this week. So how's the game, you ask? In a word, slow. Which is not exactly what you want to hear about your racing game. Since they all chug at a snail's pace, I can't say any version is better than the other. Unless you were to play a modded ROM via emulation, which I wouldn't dare recommend. But I am showing footage of what that might look like, just for your own edification. LHX Attack Chopper is also an early 90s 3D game, and being being on the Genesis, it suffers a similar frame rate, except there's no fixed ROM of this one. Which is a shame, because the visuals are super impressive without any special chips or add-ons. But other than that, it's basically a primitive version of AH Thunderstrike. Break Time, the National Pool Tour, is exactly what you'd expect on the NES. Something I found a bit unique was an attempt to humanize your opponents, with their own nicknames, hometowns, and sometimes you get flavor text, like, no problem. I'm not sure. And? Please go in. I paused so people who typically say that's what she said a lot could, you know, slip one in. Heyo, Dracula the Undead is a point and click horror game on the Atari Lynx. You don't see too many horror games on a handheld, maybe because you can't play it in the dark? While there are no real scares to be had, when it comes to tension and atmosphere, I think this game nails it. The music is creepy as you stumble around a poorly lit castle, trying to combine a book with a crowbar with some twine because point and click logic. I was on edge the whole time, especially while I was on the edge of the building, knowing I could slip and fall to my death at the slightest misstep. You've got Bram Stoker himself narrating your actions, whilst getting cozy by the fireplace as a storm rages outside. At one point, Dracula's wives break into your bedroom begging for your kisses until he barges in with a bag of Wendy's. That was a weird night. I'll bet breakfast was awkward. Nine games released on these five consoles this week in 1993. Despite the slow pace and obtuse puzzles, Dracula the Undead borders the line of hidden gem territory for the system. And the best part about Lynx games is that they're all super cheap because nobody wants them. That's what she said. Now back to Jared in the Collector's Corner. Thank you, Dylan. Wolfchild is this week's biggest value gainer. It released with an MSRP of $49.95, and now the disc alone is $60, whereas a full complete game is $200. The hunt for Red October has sunk. A cartridge is less than 10 bucks, and a box and manual with it is still less than $40. Thunderstrike, being one of the best Sega CD games, is widely available. A disc can be found for only $15, and with a plastic case and manual for $25. And that's it for today. Next week, an obscure fighter, a strategy game, and the Sega CD releases keep on rolling. I'm your host, Jared, and this was Now in the 90s. Thank you so much for watching Now in the 90s. I want to thank some patrons this week like FarmCat84, Super Bunny Bun, and Justin Blackwood. Please like the video and leave a comment down below and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you already are a subscriber, thank you so much for watching every single episode every Friday. I am so stoked for this year. I'm actually having a lot of fun with all these Sega CD releases coming out because it's an excuse to learn about and play a bunch of games that I never got to beforehand. I never played the Sega CD version of Wolfchild until this week. 